Alors, bonjour tout le monde. Bienvenue à notre première rencontre de la série En Conversation. On vous souhaite la bienvenue au public qui nous écoute sur YouTube et à nos élèves, évidemment, qui sont, qui sont avec nous aujourd'hui. Good afternoon to all. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this first In Conversation with. Um, well, special welcome to all of you watching live on YouTube and, of course, to our students joining us as well. Um, We'd like to thank our uh, sponsors and partners. Uh, L'OF reconnaît l'appui du gouvernement du Canada. The OF acknowledges the government of Canada's support and uh, et de Emploi Montréal, uh, Ile de Montréal, Québec. L'OF remercie ses commanditaires. The OF would like to thank their private sponsors, Canimex et Panorama Media. L'OF remercie les fondations suivantes. The OF would like to thank the following foundations. La Fondation RBC, la Fondation Sibila SE, le Fonds AIDA de la Fondation Jeunesse Musicale du Canada et la Fondation de la Famille Zeller. Nous vous invitons à consulter notre site web au www.orchestrefranco.com ainsi que notre Instagram, vous êtes sur YouTube déjà, et puis le Facebook de l'orchestre aussi. We welcome you to have a look at our websites for upcoming activities. Uh, our Instagram account, as well as uh, our Facebook page. Alors, aujourd'hui, c'est la première uh, rencontre uh, de cette nouvelle série qu'on a ajoutée cette année, uh, dans le but d'inviter de, des gens uh, avec qui on avait le goût uh, d'approfondir certains sujets. Uh, today is the first of our In Conversation With, and we, uh, in this series, want to invite uh, people we, uh, we really like and people who uh, we want to uh, have a specific discussions about very important topics. And uh, what a guest uh, we have uh, today, uh, Ken McLeod. Hi, Ken. Thank you to be with us today. Uh, I'll, tell, uh, I'll tell you all a few words about Ken. Je vais vous donner un petit peu d'informations sur Ken. Uh, Ken is president and CEO of the New Brunswick Youth Orchestra and Sistema New Brunswick. He's been a leader in the nonprofit sector for 25 years as a senior manager, volunteer, board member, donor, and consultant. As I said, Ken is president and CEO of the internationally acclaimed New Brunswick Youth Orchestra. And over the last 14 years, he has led the development of what is today uh, one of the most interesting and uh, innovative youth orchestra programs in Canada. Uh, Ken was uh, recognized in 2015 by a prime minister's award for social innovation. In 2009, Ken participated to the launch of Sistema New Brunswick, who offers social change and hope to vulnerable children through music. Sistema New Brunswick is expanding annually and operates five Sistema uh, New Brunswick centers and uh, serving more than 700 children daily. This is fantastic. In a recent book, Nuts, Bolts, and a Few Loose Screws by Gare Maxwell, Ken was profiled, uh, and this is very good, I agree with that, as the virtuoso of visions, for his work with the NBYU and Sistema New Brunswick. Ken is founder and president of KMA Consultants, a firm that specializes in fundraising and communications for nonprofits in Canada. From 1995 to 1999, uh, Ken served as a member of the Legislative Assembly of New Brunswick. He is a graduate of Acadia University and Mount Allison University, a recipient of the Order of Moncton and a Paul Harris Fellow. He also has served on numerous local, regional, and national boards. And is a, as you'll see today, is a, a very uh, uh, sought after presenter at the different symposiums and conferences. Uh, we're very, very happy to have you, Ken. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to welcome you to uh, our OF family. We have done uh, many nice collaborations in the past. Uh, and I always, uh, I always look forward to uh, spending time with you. So uh, I know that today's presentation uh, will uh, will first start with uh, having you tell us about all the great things you're doing over there. And we will take uh, questions, uh, if that's okay with you, towards the end of the session and uh, we'll go from there. So again, thank you to, uh, for being with us. And I leave it to you now to tell, all, tell us all about Sistema New Brunswick. Perfect. Thank you very, very much, Jean-Philippe. It's a great pleasure and honor to be uh, a guest with your uh, orchestra today. So I've, I've been looking forward to this and happy to have this chance to connect uh, with each other. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, the topic that I'm gonna speak on is social change 
through music in the orchestra. So I'd like to make a presentation uh, that summarizes some of my thinking, some of our activities, uh, how that is influenced and what kind of impact this, this approach, uh, this uh, sort of lens through which we approach music, how that's, uh, what kind of impact that's had on people, community, and our organization. Um, uh, be happy to take some Q&As. If there's interest and time, uh, I could also share uh, some short video clips. It might be interesting for people to see, for example, in our Sistema, uh, I could show little clips of, of a minute or so uh, when kids are with us six weeks, 18 weeks, two years, five years. It would give some sense of perspective in terms of uh, uh, what that looks like. So if, if that's of interest, I can do that after. I'll just plant that seed. So That'd be fantastic. So th th this would be my thesis. Making good sounds just isn't good enough anymore. Especially if you're a kid like Lynn or Grace or Ben. And let me tell you about them. Lynn comes from a home with a single mother with addiction challenges. In Systema New Brunswick, she found in her teacher a positive male role model and a place of safety and comfort where she could thrive. Grace. Grace lives in Crescent Valley uh, in the St. John area, a single mom on social assistance. Uh, Grace attended Sistema New Brunswick every day after school. Because of that, her mom was able to go back to school and finish her GED. Then she went to community college and, uh, and studied veterinary assistance and now she's working and supporting her family. Uh, let me give you a third example, Ben. Ben is one of three kids in his family. Uh, at seven years old, he was already on quite a, a, a difficult path in his life. Uh, he was caught stealing, acting up at school. He had poor marks. Uh, he was labeled at seven years old, a troublemaker. In Sistema, he started to advance on the violin. Unusual for him, he was now being singled out for doing really well. He became more focused, he became a better student. In the music festival, he won gold and first place, and he had his picture on the front page of the newspaper. Uh, ben was selected to play at the festival gala. For the first time in his life, his family bought him a new set of clothes for, for the performance at the gala. When he finished performing, there really are no words in the English language to describe the emotional embrace between Ben and his family at the front of the stage. So playing in the orchestra, Ben and the others are no longer children of poverty. As part of the orchestra, they are transported to a new place where everything is possible. And the incredible power of their own accomplishment is tangible. The nurturing impact of playing music together is on display for everybody. That's the transformative power of music. And these are just a, a few of literally hundreds of stories that I could share with you since we started Sistema uh, um, uh, 12 years ago. Now, having said that, this doesn't happen by accident. It's a choice, and it's a choice that became clear to me and others that making good sounds is just not good enough anymore. Instead, we chose to harness music to change lives. Now, let me give you just a, a little bit of background. Uh, I've had the chance to speak at, uh, at a number of international conferences in recent years. Uh, in Los Angeles, the Take a Stand Symposium of the LA Philharmonic. Uh, in Rotterdam, Classical Next, which is the world's biggest classical music meeting for leaders and thinkers and innovators in the music industry. And then uh, more recently at the first international music education conference put on by the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra. 
I was really proud to represent the NBYO and Sistema New Brunswick at these events. But what I enjoyed the most was the chance to be exposed to really great people who have great ideas and who have leading practices from all over the world. More and more, uh, what I'm coming to believe is that music is serious business. And let me explain. In Israel, uh, the conference started with a performance by Shesh Besh. It's an Arab Jewish music ensemble of the Israel Philharmonic. The, the ensemble is a model of tolerance and mutual respect in a very turbulent and violent Middle East. Uh, what we experienced in that moment was uh, uh, generations of conflict bridged by music. In a sense, it was a, a living metaphor for people working to coexist together. There were no barriers. There was just music and joy and friends. Now, one thing that stood out to me in this conference in Israel, it's that speaker after speaker uh, from quite a diverse range of countries and cultures and traditions, in one way or another, every single speaker talked about the teeming, worrisome challenges, circumstances, and conditions in the society today. So things like growing income inequality, exclusion, poverty, insecurity, uh, conflict, opportunity gap, loss of hope. And, uh, and so uh, one of the speakers, Dr. Tom Lev, he's the head of the School of Music at uh, Tel Aviv University. Uh, he said this, making good sounds is just not good enough anymore. It's a really profound idea. And if it's true, it has important implications for music and music education and the arts in general in our society. Let me name a couple of others at this conference who said similar things. Uh, uh, Sir Clive Gillinson, he's the executive director and artistic director of Carnegie Hall. Uh, he told us that the focus of his organization is to do three things, great music, unforgettable experiences, and to transform lives. Audre Quadros from Boston University, he talked about building community through music. The mayor of Rotterdam talked about music's power to unite communities through music and build local pride. And then there were speakers from Finland and Sweden, and they talked about the necessity of access, regardless of political, religious, ethnic, economic uh, background, that access is incredibly important that when people are left out, it can be devastating to them. It can be devastating to their family and to the society. And that group music making is one answer. So again, T Tom Lev from uh, Tel Aviv uh, University, making good sounds is just not good enough anymore. So it's been my conviction for some time that for musicians, music making and music education organizations that there's a wider responsibility to the community and the society that we live in. Um, so what does that mean? It means that, 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 that rather than be detached, we have to promote conversation and dialogue. It means that our focus must be to be better musicians and better teachers, but also better citizens. It means that we can promote through music, mutual understanding, human rights, human values, uh, that we can use music as a means for tolerance, openness, and respect in a multicultural society. And that we must be relevant and engaged with the society that we are part of. Well, that's been the focus of the New Brunswick Youth Orchestra's Sistema program. So social change, social development through music in the orchestra.
So, well, why did we pick this? Well, it, it made sense for us as a youth orchestra to focus on kids who are left out. Uh, when kids are left out, we sometimes refer to them as being at risk. And, you know, I would say they're not at risk because the risk has already happened. Uh, children who are left out are being harmed every day and it's having devastating consequences in their life. So we know this already, that when kids are left out, for example, if they come from uh, an e economically disadvantaged family, they're more frequently absent from school. They fall behind in literacy and school performance. They have more behavior problems. Fewer of them finish school, fewer go on to advanced education, and more of them are unemployed or underemployed. So when children don't have opportunity or options, then there's no way for them to, to belong, no way for them to grow or to thrive, and they lose precious potential and their futures in the, become, become jeopardized. So um, let me just see if I want to go to this slide. Yes, okay. And so that's the path for kids that are left out unless we can provide a different path. So here are the guiding principles behind our Sistema program. I sometimes refer to this as the secret sauce. Uh, you know, how, how are we able to realize profound positive changes in the lives of the children that are a part of our program. Well, at the, at the foundation are these organizing principles. The first one is inclusion. So we prioritize kids who would be left out. So for that, for us, that means children from economically disadvantaged families, children of immigrant families and other at-risk circumstances. I'll give you an example. We've just uh, created an agreement with the provincial government that we're going to provide, we're gonna reserve a certain number of seats beginning in our next season in September for children who are under the care of the Minister of Social Development. That means they've been taken out of their home and they've been placed in a foster home. So, so there's another way that we can engage kids that are left out, uh, kids that have challenges, who are on a negative path in their life. So inclusion means we're, we're focused as a priority to engage kids that are left out. The second principle is intensity. So when children attend our program, they attend three hours after school, five days a week for 10 months of the year. So think of that, every day after school, every week, every month for 10 months of the year. So here's what we know, and musicians know this better than anybody does. You can't get really good at something if you don't invest time and effort. And it's the getting good at something that can be transformational in the life of a young person. What happens, of course, three hours every day with a really good teacher, they're gonna get really good at the music. And they begin to connect the dots between their effort and hard work every day, every day, every day, every day. There's no shortcut to achievement. There's no quick fix to excellence, right? So they connect the dots between their hard work and their achievement in music and as part of the orchestra. And it's almost at some moment a light goes on and they understand I can do things. They understand their capacity as a human being and that can change the entire direction of their life in a positive way. So intensity. The third principle is excellence. Uh, one of the things that we say is uh, good enough is not good enough. Uh, we're, we emphasize excellence in terms of behavior and learning and performance. And you know, uh, we also believe uh, intensely that just because a child comes from a poor family, uh, they can uh, have every possibility to achieve at the highest levels as someone from a middle or income or middle or upper income family might have. 
So we have high expectations for learning and performance and the children rise to the challenge. The fourth principle is ensemble based. In our programs, kids are part of an orchestra from the first day. They learn in groups. So in that context, they're learning uh, uh, focus and discipline as part of an orchestra. They're learning respect with their seatmate. They're learning how to cooperate with a group. They're part of something bigger than themselves that gives them a sense of purpose and place in the society. So these are the organizing principles behind Sistema that, that give it such influence. Okay, so, so what has been the result of this kind of thinking? For the kids that we serve, but also for our organization. So first for the kids. Well, the results have been nothing short of profound. Uh, they attend school more consistently. Their behavior improves, their grades go up. They show more confidence and self-esteem. Uh, they also reach impressive levels of musical performance, uh, really far beyond what anyone thought was possible. Uh, we have symphony orchestras of 100 children, eight years old. You know, it's performing at, at a high level. It's, uh, you know, it's inspiring and mind blowing. And so what inspires me the most about what we're doing is that children's capacity is being unleashed. And that's happening in and through their involvement in Sistema. Children are teaching themselves their own capacity. They're connecting the dots between their hard work and their achievement. And uh, really, for many of these kids, for the first time in their life, they understand their capacity for achievement. And, uh, and, and that understanding can transform their life. Okay, so what has been the impact of this kind of thinking for our organization? Well, I'm going to summarize that by sort of painting a picture of then and now. So what did our organization look like before Sistema and now? By the way, the New Brunswick Youth Orchestra has been around since 1965. So it's been around for a while. We only started Sistema in 2009. So what's been the impact of this kind of thinking for our organization? Oh, sorry, I see I blocked your view again. Sorry about that. Uh, so here's how our impact, uh, our organization has been changed. So in, in terms of number of musicians, we would have 70 to 80 in the provincial orchestra. Today, we have more than, uh, probably closer to 1,200 uh, children and youth in our programs. Orchestras, we had one, we have more than 15 orchestras. Number of performances annually, and, and this number is pre-COVID, okay? So, uh, uh, so in the year just pre previous to COVID, uh, we also have some pretty impressive stats during the COVID year, but uh, Pre-COVID, uh, we, we would have done five concerts in a season with the NBYO. Uh, in that year, across all our programs, we did more than a, almost 150 uh, performance events. Patrons, we probably would add less than 1,000 in a season. Uh, in, in the pre-COVID year, we had more than 80,000 attended our performance events across all our programs. Pre-COVID, we had two part-time staff. Today, we have more than 70 employees full-time on our payroll. Pre-COVID, uh, a small annual budget, $30,000. We're now almost three and a half million in, in terms of our annual budget. Uh, uh, the impact really goes beyond that. Um, you know, CD recordings, media stories, prizes and recognition, uh, commissions of original work, uh, more collaborations with guest artists, conductors, uh, uh, clinicians, and so on. And, uh, uh, and in terms of the, the scope of programming, um, you can see here, the New Brunswick Youth Orchestra is the organization, uh, but now we have several levels of programming. So the Sistema, I refer to that as local children's orchestras. Uh, and uh, 
we have, we're, we're in nine communities in New Brunswick. Then we have regional youth orchestras. That's our most advanced Sistema kids. We have two of those right now in Moncton and St. John. Eventually we'll have four to five regional youth orchestras in the province. And then of course the provincial youth orchestras, local children, regional youth, provincial youth, and we have a professional orchestra of our teaching staff, uh, Tuta Musica. So we can engage children from six years of age and, and youth from six years of age through university. Uh, okay, so I, I don't wanna talk too much longer, just a couple of other things to share with you. Uh, a question, I think a, a good question to ask is, uh, how did we achieve this, this change? Because it's a pretty significant change. Uh, and I, I'll just share two things with you, two ideas. I'd say the first element and the starting point was our mission. And it may sound like a simple thing, but it's absolutely pivotal to everything that we've done over the last 10 or 12 years. Uh, I, I would say about a mission statement, it describes the purpose of the organization. It answers the why question. Uh, and mission statements need to be clear. They need to be succinct. There can't be any ambiguity in a mission statement. Uh, they should be people oriented. Mission statements speak to the heart, but they also have to intellectually make sense. So this was a new mission statement that arose out of a strategic planning process in 2007. And this mission statement was, was really a revolutionary idea for our organization. The NBYO at that point had existed for four decades. It was a very traditional youth orchestra program, 70 to 80 kids chosen by audition every year, largely from middle and upper income families. But at that moment, we thought to ourselves, surely we can do better. What about the kids that are left out? And when I say left out, not just left out from the NBYO, but left out from most of the good things that life has to offer. So our mission at that moment uh, 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 was, was, was a significant and important change. So, sorry, if I go back, let me just go back. So, inspire children and youth to achieve their full potential. That's a social mission, right? Now, there's also a second phrase, through learning and performing orchestral music. That's the tool and the vehicle for achieving our social mission in the world. So, great music, yes, we're still in favor of great music, of excellence in music performance. But even more, how do we provide opportunity for more children and youth? How can we help them to succeed in their lives and achieve their full potential? So the first important element of our transformation was developing a mission that's more inclusive, it's more relevant, it's more impactful in the wider society. That's a big mission, that's a big task. Uh, but this mission became the new lens through which we view everything as an organization. Now, secondly, and I, I, I could spend a, a whole talk just on this topic, okay? But, but I wanna just mention it because some of you are going to, you either are leading or will lead social change through music programs. Um, I think this was also one of the important things that we did that has substantially influenced our, our, our results over the past number of years. We developed an intentional organizational culture. So, uh, and here's what I would say about that. All organizations have a culture, <laughs> even if you don't know it, even if it's not planned. In fact, you can sense an organization's culture, as soon as you walk into their space and as soon as you meet their people. So an organizational culture can be accidental, right? Uh, and, and that's when we assume that everybody knows 
what the enterprise is all about, what values are prized, what actions are expected. Uh, I, I won't spend much time on this, but I will say this. Uh, uh, organizations with an accidental culture could be successful, but I, I guarantee they won't be as successful as they could be if they had an intentional organizational culture. Now, the other thing I'd say is truly dysfunctional, underperforming, and toxic organizational cultures are always accidental. No one plans for that, right? So our conviction is that an intentional organizational culture generates the maximum benefits. So we set out to create a culture that would do these things, uh, that would propel the organization toward the greatest impact among those we serve, the highest level of consensus and commitment among our team members, and the highest level of satisfaction of all the stakeholders. So think about that. Leaving these things to chance just seems too risky. So we chose to create an intentional culture. Now, this is our model. It's it would take a long time to unpack it all, but I just want to share this. Uh, um, so what has to happen for, for culture to take hold within an organization? We have to do several things. We have to affect how our people think. Then we have to ensure that our people act in alignment with how we think. And then we have to sustain that thinking and acting over time. So creating an organizational culture intentionally is a product of how we think, how we act, and how we sustain that thinking and acting over time. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to show you something, and then I'll be off this because I know there's questions. Ultimately, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, let me hold it up there. Okay, so we, we, we ultimately boil down our organizational culture into something that we call the NBYO experience. So organizational culture, it sounds kind of technical and uh, it's not too inspiring. So instead, we came up with, with the phrase, the NBYO experience. So what does the NBYO experience look like? And I'm just gonna show you the end product here, okay? So, okay, this is it, it's a, it folds out. Okay, so on, on this card, uh, how we think, there's three parts to that, mission, vision, and values. So there's a panel here with our mission, our vision, and our values, how we think. Second, how we act. We came up with two tools here. One was a motto uh, and the other is a pledge. Okay, so our motto is very important people serving very important people. This, and so this helps guide our actions. It describes how we relate to each other as a team and how we relate to our kids and to our wider stakeholders. And, and in addition to that, there's a pledge so you know what, it's, it's one thing to have mission, vision, and values, but it's almost like translating a language. Like what, does, what do those mission, vision, and values look like in the day-to-day -day operations of our program? So we came up with a pledge statement that's sort of the translation of that. These are pledges that we make. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, uh, I will be responsive to the expressed and unexpressed wishes of our young artists. So see the idea here, we don't wanna just meet expectations. We wanna exceed expectations. Uh, we want to anticipate needs and respond to them. That's the level of service that we wanna provide. I'll give you one example, how, how one of our team members translated that. We have a little fund called the NBYO Experience Fund. By the way, this is putting our money where our mouth is, okay? So our teaching artists can draw on that fund to deliver on our promise, 
right? So a clarinet teacher had a really promising student, wanted to inspire that student to the next level of achievement. So he drew on funds from the NBYR Experience Fund, went out and bought an upgraded mouthpiece, presented it to the kid and said, you're doing really well. I see such great growth and, and achievement. I know you can get to the next level and this will help. So can you imagine uh, the impact that had on that young learner? It, it, it inspired them, it lifted them up, uh, confidence and support from their teacher. For the teacher, you know, they've got liberty and freedom uh, to, you know, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, an opportunity to do the best they can and to have the biggest impact. Anyway, uh, so uh, creating culture, what kind of organization do you want to have? It's important to think about that intentionally, to build that from the ground up, to get agreement, make sure there's alignment. And so, and, and the last one on there, so how we think mission, vision, and values, how we act is motto and pledge. How do we sustain that? Because here's, the, here's what I see in many, many organizations. Uh, they might do the culture or, or the mission talk at the beginning of the year. Frankly, it's often forgotten by the end of the meeting or the end of the day. Certainly, the first time a hardship comes up, it's out the window. So how do we sustain our culture every day, every week, every month, year over year? Uh, we came up with something called the 20-minute dress rehearsal. Okay, it's the last panel on this, uh, on this uh, thing. So what happens is our team all over the province once a week meets for 20 minutes around this. They, they, they think out loud about our mission, vision, and values. Someone shares a story about exemplary service, and then they have a discussion of how that reflects our values as an organization. And so the idea is we're always thinking about our mission, vision, values, our pledge, and how we are going to create this culture in our organization. So because it's something you can forget. And uh, so we're, we're constantly reminding ourselves, encouraging each other with positive stories and so on. So mission and culture, two big parts of creating successful organizations. Okay, I'm going to... I've been saying this now forever, but I promise now just a few closing comments. Uh, I would say uh, the well, a couple of a couple of examples. Uh, just pre-COVID, um, I had the pleasure of taking eight of our Sistema musicians to Mexico City as part of a youth orchestra workshop. Uh, some of these students didn't have passports, of course. They had never been on an airplane before. Uh, in Mexico City, they joined with 160 young musicians. They were selected from across North and South America and their coaches were among the best in the world. The, the sectional coaches were the musicians of the Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, Arturo Marquez was, um, was, was, was uh, one of the conductors and also uh, Gustavo Dudamel. In Mexico City, our violinist from our Sistema program was the, chair, was the second chair in the violin section. Uh, our bassoon player was selected for a solo in the concert. Our trombone player was the only female in an all male section. Uh, these young people did so well musically, but also they are wonderful ambassadors for themselves and also for the organization and our province and for Canada. Uh, I, I have to tell you, you know, I, I kind of, felt the pride of a parent uh, with our kids in, in Mexico City. Um, I think people are the most convincing story that we have. Um, I, I'll share another couple of stories with you because they're 
they're so prominent. Uh, because we started 12 years ago and our kids begin with us in grades one, two, or three, we're just now beginning to have graduates from high school. So this year, Evan Swansburg graduated in June. Evan started with us in 2009, our first year, and he was in grade one. He was in our programs for 12 years, three levels of children's orchestras, regional youth orchestra, provincial youth orchestra. He's going to St. Mary's University in September to study astrophysics. Awesome. We're not trying to produce all musicians. We want kids to, to be able to live up their, uh, their potential as a human being. I sometimes jokingly say, you know, the natural next step for a musician is astrophysics. Uh, so we're very proud of Evan. We have two of our kids at Dalhousie studying medical science. We have one doing linguistics over at Memorial University, someone else doing uh, social work at UDM. We have quite a large number uh, in music studies. Uh, and, and, and at the largest universities in the country with top scholarships at McGill, U of T, Western, and others, University of Ottawa and, uh, and so on. So I guess I would close by saying this. Uh, I, the world that I have the honor to live in every day is, uh, it, it humbles me really. I, I'm, I'm, I'm touched by the stories of people like Lynn and Grace and Ben and Evan and others um, who have come who come from incredible challenges in their life and circumstances, but show such uh, grit and determination and grace and achievement. So I find that very humbling. I'm also more convinced than I've ever been that talent is universally distributed in the world but opportunity is not. But when we can give, provide an opportunity for the Lynn's, Grace's, Ben's, Evans, right? Uh, when we can provide the opportunity, they can experience beauty in the music, but also in their life. And, uh, and, and that's really how we have the chance to change the world, one piece of music and one young person at a time. So music and the orchestra is a powerful and profound tool and vehicle for social change. And, uh, and uh, there are many opportunities for us to, to grab a hold of and to, uh, and to make a difference in the, in the environment and the context in which we live. So I've talked way too long, Jean-Philippe, uh, I don't know what you'd like to do next. If uh, uh, I guess I'll finish that. How about if I stop sharing? And uh, let me stop sharing. And would you like to do a Q and A? I can show some video. But sure, I can. Let's uh, let's uh, give a few moments to uh, to everybody to send us uh, their questions. Uh, just before we go the, to the questions, can uh, I'm thinking about all of our players at OF and uh, former players, uh, current players. Uh, I know that some of them have uh, have done some work with uh, with you in New Brunswick, but uh, tell us a little bit how you do the how you recruit your musicians and what are the some of the opportunities that uh, that could be offered. Okay, that's great. Thank you for asking that. Uh, so we have uh, right now we have 58 teaching artists on our staff team. Um, almost probably 35%, maybe even close to 40, have come from outside of Canada. Uh, so it's quite a diverse faculty. Uh, our music director and conductor is Tony Delgado. Tony, uh, in fact, we probably have about 10 Venezuelans on our staff team, which, is, which has really accelerated our development because, you know, the program was developed there originally. Uh, you know, the whole world has looked there for inspiration. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the staff that we brought, I mean, this whole idea of music and social change is just a part of their being, you know, it just, they've lived it themselves. And, uh, and, uh, and so 
but we have others from the US and from Colombia and uh, um, South Korea and from Mexico and so from all over. Uh, we have openings uh, right now in uh, violin, viola, cello, and bass for teaching artists. So, uh, and we also, uh, and in um, trying to think of others. Uh, so um, we, we, most of our staff would have performance, grad, you know, would be performance majors. And, and that's strategic on our part, uh, not all, but the majority would. Uh, we really, you know, teaching artists, they, they, both parts are important. So we're looking for people who are really good musicians, who are really good teachers, and who are also socially minded. And that last part is critical. Uh, you know, it has to be someone who would have a passion for helping young people to uh, not just achieve in music, but to have a successful life. That's the frame of reference that we work in. And so, you know, have, being socially minded is a really important part. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so performance majors, because we teaching artists become mentors and role models as artists to our kids. And that's really, really important to us. So we employ our, our teaching artists are on salary 12 months of the year. Um, we also have additional opportunities for earning income beyond that. Uh, for example, in our regional and provincial orchestras, they have to have individual lessons at least once, uh, once a week. So, um, so, so they can have private students from within our own program. Uh, also sectional coaches for the uh, regional and provincial youth orchestra. And then Tuta Musica, we're building that gradually, uh, the professional orchestra of our teaching staff. And uh, so there's opportunities to play professionally also. And we also provide uh, support to, our, to the teaching artists uh, uh, we, uh, to, to further play professionally. So if they form small ensembles, uh, they can apply and get financial support. They, for example, rent a venue for a performance. We want to help with that. We will help with branding and marketing. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, the teaching artists have to be fulfilled as artists as well within our program. So that's important. So uh, there's a few thoughts. If there's anything further, ask away. That's wonderful. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Ken. And uh, we'll certainly will. Uh, uh, encourage our students to uh, to learn more about the organization and if it's a great i know that from the one that i've done to them to do work with you how uh, fulfilled they feel after spending time there so okay so we're getting pretty good questions uh in uh let's start uh, from the top uh, so we Mar maria sofia can I ask you what inspired you personally to work in the nonprofit sector and more specifically with nbyu and systema and did a specific event or specific environment in your personal life inspire you before getting to hear the incredible stories of the children who studied through these programs? Well, that's a really great question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, it's a, uh, I'm almost too busy to reflect back. You know, <laughs> there's so much going on, but once in a while I do. And, uh, you know, I found that my habit has been to um, accept opportunities when they present themselves. So I started my career as a biologist. So again, I play no instrument I, I, uh, at all. So um, uh, after, so I, I did research in heart muscle physiology, uh, published papers, uh, but in 1985, the university asked me if I had become their development director. Well, all I knew at that moment, because fundraising as a profession didn't exist in 1985, okay? Hospitals were just starting to raise money from private donors, right? So all I knew is I'd be on the management team and I'd have a chance to contribute to the future of the organization. So I said, yes. And uh, the last project I ran at, the, at that school was to a $13 million campaign, 
to relocate, build a new campus, start expand programs and so on. Uh, then I, through that process, I got connected to the provincial government and someone uh, in the McKenna government at the time, uh, Frank McKenna, who was our premier, later became the uh, uh, ambassador, Canadian ambassador to, to the US. Uh, they came and asked if I would run in a provincial election. And I said, yes. And so uh, I had the chance to be in government for a while and it was incredibly uh, a great experience. I learned a lot. The year I was elected, I also started a fundraising consulting company. So I had an office in Moncton, an office in Toronto, and we serve clients all across Canada. Um, and uh, so as far as music, I got involved through my daughters. Uh, I have two daughters, one played violin, the other cello. And uh, I, I still remember um, my daughter auditioned two years for the MBYO and didn't get in either of those two years. The third year, she hung in there and you know, did the audition and got into the orchestra. I can tell you, I remember the first day I dropped her off for a one week camp in the summer at the beginning of the season. And like any parent, I was standing along the back wall, you know, just getting ready to say goodbye. And interestingly, the, the president of the NBYO was standing beside me and she just happened to mention the orchestra had received an invitation to play in a festival at Carnegie Hall. They had no intention to go. Uh, the organization had a $30,000 annual budget, right? Two part-time staff. It, it just, in my mind, the instant thought is how can you not say yes, right? Like that one thing would do more for the organization than everything you've done to, collectively in the last 10 years. So I went to the board and said, uh, uh, if we can raise the money, can we go? So uh, they sort of, you know, with a smirk on their face said yes. And uh, it was $140,000 budget. We raised 145,000. Uh, we went to Carnegie. We recorded the music, the first recording ever of the NBYO. A documentary film company heard about this and followed our organization for 10 months. Rehearsals, fundraising, in the bus, in New York, on the stage at Carnegie Hall. And that documentary was on primetime CBC, it was called Practice, Practice, Practice. So think of, the, of how important that was in the life of the organization, raised its visibility, its profile. And anyway, just so, so I became then a board member, board chair, and uh, ultimately uh, the CEO. When I started Sistema, uh, I was a full-time unpaid employee. Uh, which I did for, for, you know, now I was in a position I could do that. Uh, and, uh, and, um, and, and was able to do that for the first several years of the development of the program. And uh, anyway, so yeah, those are some of the factors. Wonderful. Uh, let's have a question uh, coming from Bertille. Uh, hello, how did your organization remain active during the COVID-19 pandemic? That's actually uh, something I was uh, looking to, uh, to ask you as well. So that's, let's yeah. hear that. Really good question. Uh, I'll tell you what, what, what shaped our last year and a half. Um, at the beginning, here's, here's the agreement that we came to as a team is that we weren't just gonna hang on by our fingernails. We're not just gonna hunker down and hope we get through it. We're gonna thrive and see our kids advance during this period. So it was a mindset, right? Uh, so, so that was a choice. And, uh, and I can tell you, uh, I'm so impressed. Uh, our, our, Professional staff team are an incredible collection of human beings. Uh, the, you know, the, the optimism, the energy, uh, the learning that's taken place. Uh, so um, we operated remotely. Um, uh, and so our team learned how to do, you know, instrument sectionals <laughs> remotely. So 
after some experimentation, we, we prioritized individual lessons and instrument sectionals. And our team became really, really good at it. So we, we kept everyone employed throughout. Uh, we kept engaged with our kids. And here's what we learned, that our kids during this period have felt even more isolated than they would have otherwise. Think of a child in, 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 in coming from a, a very challenging background. So now they're home every day in an environment where there's poverty, food insecurity, addictions, mental health issues, you know, the list goes on and on. And so our kids felt even more isolated during this period. Uh, and so a, a, a continuous connection with their teacher and with their uh, colleagues uh, proved to be incredibly important during this period. So uh, we, we transitioned back and forth between uh, in-person and remotely, depending on the, you know, if it was, you know, yellow, orange, or red. And uh, in this past year, uh, and, and by the way, we did, we did all the things that others were doing. We did live stream performances. We did recordings and then, you know, social media posting of, 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 of performances. Uh, we even had uh, guest artists during COVID. And we did a, we did a guest artist piece with Misha Bruger gosman with one of our uh, Moncton Youth Orchestra string ensembles because we were able to, uh, the health requirement, we could be in bubbles of 15. Two bubbles could be in the same room if they are separated by two, two meters. So we could actually have an ensemble of 30 musicians, which we did, and did a recording and, and so on with Misha. Uh, in the past 10 months, we, did, we had 66 performance events on social media and, and over 100,000 views of those performance events. So, um, so I think, you know, I'm very, very proud of our team and uh, how, you know, they're learning and their determination to serve kids, right? Which is our, our driving force as an organization. That's fantastic. Uh, it's a uh, way to go, that's great. Uh, another well, very nice uh, question coming up uh, for you, Ken. Alexander asks, uh, how is the, the three hours a day divided? Are there private lessons and time for personal practice in addition to ensemble rehearsals? Okay, that's really a good question. Uh, in the Sistema, the Children's Orchestra program, teaching artists uh, are required to do about five hours of individual lessons a month. It's not much, right? So in our Sistema, the core, the backbone of our program is the instrument sectional. So, so our, just to describe our, uh, our, uh, our curriculum is the repertoire, okay? We're, and we're, we're organized in trimesters. So there's a new set of music in September, a concert in December, a new set of music in January, a concert in March, new set of music in, in uh, April and a concert in June. So, and the repertoire is progressive to build, you know, skills. So it's progressive from trimester to trimester and from year to year and levels of orchestras. So in the Moncton Center where I am today, we have three levels of children's orchestras. So each one having the trimester and, uh, and so on. So the kids are always working toward a performance state. So the backbone of the program is the instrument sectional, you know, the clarinet kids with the clarinet specialist, the bassoon kids with a bassoon specialist. And, uh, and so uh, as you think about how a trimester might run, uh, a lot of time is spent in the instrument sectional on the repertoire. As we get closer to a performance date, we have more group sectionals and then closer still 2D rehearsals and then a concert event. And so, uh, but the five hours a month is, you know, that, you know, a teaching artist might identify a young person that has exceptional talent and, and needs, needs more enrichment, right, to, to keep them going forward. Or there might be someone that's struggling. 
Now, once kids graduate into our regional youth orchestras, then individual lessons weekly are required. Uh, and, uh, and, and those, and, and again, if, if our kids don't have the resources, we pay that, we pay the teaching artists to do those individual lessons. Again, fantastic. It's, uh, so clear. Um, that's a special request more than a question. And I, I actually would love to, to, if you say yes to that too. Uh, so Kaylin asks, uh, he, he says, I'd love to hear the videos of the kid playing uh, to hear their progress with Sistema. So we, maybe we take a little moment if you, if you want to share a few of those videos with us. And, and do we have a half an hour left? Is that the time frame? So why don't I take like 10 minutes on videos and there might Perfect. be some, uh, some- Perfect, then we'll come back to questions after that. Okay, Great. perfect. Let me uh, just take over the screen here. This is, this is, I just wanna explain a couple things. This is week eight, okay? So think about this because uh, context is important. In, in, an, in an average classroom in the public school, maybe 15% or 20% of the kids might be at risk, right? Would that be fair? Somewhere in that range. In our classrooms, it's 80%. Okay, so, so just think about that. The majority of our kids come from some of the most challenging backgrounds and environments. So in the first, think of the first day, six and seven year olds arrive in our school. Okay, the first day, they've been in school all day. They're there for three hours. In the first weeks, we can't keep their focus and attention for three minutes, <laughs> let alone three hours. Okay, so the things that we're beginning to work on on the first day, they start learning music notation. They start learning solfege immediately. It's, it's a built-in part of our program. Uh, uh, they, uh, they build an instrument out of cardboard and paper mache. So we call this the paper orchestra. So th the other thing to remember is we can't really give them a real instrument. They have no sense of its value or how to care for it. Uh, they would play catch with it or, you know, swing it over their head, right? And so every child makes one. So it's also a teaching tool. They learn the parts of the instrument, resting position, playing position. They start learning mechanics and posture and, and other things. So this, this is what the paper orchestra sounds like. Okay, I'm going to stop. These are the exact same kids eight weeks later. Okay, so I'd like you to, to think about what has changed since the last video. What do you see here that's different? Okay, so let me play a little bit for you. Okay, uh, you probably noticed several things, right? First, they're all reading music, right? Uh, they've got real instruments. <laughs> uh, you probably notice a difference in the focus and attention of the kids in the classroom and taking direction. They're working together as a group. If you look at, you know, posture is pretty good with many of these kids, right? Uh, they're playing together. So there's, you know, you're, you're beginning to see some pretty positive 
changes. Okay, now I'm going to show you uh, two years. Now, this is actually in our third year, but we only started uh, in the first year, there's strings only. Second year, we added clarinet and flute. In the third year, we added all the rest of the winds, oboe, bassoon, and all the brass and percussion. Okay, so for some of these kids, it's their first year, actually for about half of them, okay? But, but uh, on average, let's say two years, there's 90 children. The average age would be eight years old. And let me play it for you. So I, I, I show you that at the end for a couple of reasons. First, you, you can't mistake the sense of pride, right? Uh, and the sense of achievement. Uh, the second thing, which I, I, I try to remind myself of this all the time, is that these kids in their entire lifetime likely wouldn't have had the applause of anybody, right? Uh, so without, without access, without opportunity, uh, there, you know, there's no moments to celebrate achievement that comes from hard work and effort. And the third thing I would point out is you can just see intuitively, this experience will have a profound impact on the lives of these kids. Uh, if you don't mind, I can do two more and they won't be long. Okay. Uh, now, the video is not really, it's not great, but anyway, this is year five. I'll just play the last phrase on F Finlandia here.
okay. And uh, the thing I'll say there is those kids would be, average age is about 12. The other thing to remember is every, and, and by the way, some of those kids would have been in their second year with us and some have been in it for five years. We place kids according to their level in the orchestras, not according to their age or their grade or how long they've been with us. And every single one of those kids started with an instrument they made out of cardboard. Uh, I'm gonna show this as a final one. And I'm just gonna show the first and I'll explain why in, in a minute. So this, this is the Provincial Youth Orchestra. I might as well say this now. So this is the Provincial Youth Orchestra. And uh, this year, more than 70% of the Provincial Youth Orchestra has come from our Sistema program. So the vast majority of this orchestra, uh, you know, had their beginnings with an instrument they made out of cardboard uh, and in our program uh, years previous. So let me just share just the first part of this. Okay, so that, that just gives you an idea. Uh, one quick story, if I could, to give you an example. Uh, so I already mentioned, of course, that uh, you know, a number of our students are finding their way to university programs uh, across the country. Uh, we just had one of our, one of our kids, uh, a, a great story, an immigrant family from Sri Lanka moved here to Canada four years ago. Um, their daughter, her first name is Shiny. I can't pronounce her last name, so I'm not going to try, but it's a beautiful name, Shiny. Uh, Shiny uh, auditioned for the uh, Asia International Clarinet Competition. Uh, she started in our program at eight years of age. She's now 12, and she won first place in this major international competition. She's 12 years old, and her repertoire was like she played music that would be sort of a second or third year university rep, rep, rep uh, 12 years old. And uh, so wonderful opportunity. Again, it just, it just drives home. All kids have talent. They don't all have opportunity and they don't all have to become musicians, but music in the orchestra is an incredibly powerful tool to bring about change for, uh, for those that might otherwise be left out. Anyway, those are a few videos. Well, it's great playing. Uh, Shostakovich is a hard, very hard piece. It sounds so well. Well done. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, here's one from uh, Nick. How is the organization communi communicating to prospective students? Is it through schools or elsewhere? And what do you find to be the most effective way of doing so? Great, great question. Uh, so here's how we do it. Um, we partner with school districts. So of course, today we have, we're located in nine communities throughout the province. So we partner with the school district. Uh, that was strategic. I won't go into why, but it's proven to be a very, very successful model for us. Um, and the school district has a socioeconomic profile of every school in their district. So along with the district superintendent, we choose only certain schools to recruit from. The schools that are in the, what you know, might call the priority neighborhoods, the low income neighborhoods. So in Moncton, for example, where there's like 65 schools in the district, we only recruit from five. That's it, in the low income neighborhoods. 
and uh, and that's because we we are purposely uh, uh, prioritizing kids from underserved communities to be a part of our program. Thanks, so, I, I should complete. So here's what we do. In the spring, we go into those five schools to the kindergarten, grade one and two. So we accept our, our string kids, grades one and two, our wind kids, grade three and four. So, uh, um, so we would go into the school in the spring in those particular schools and classrooms. Uh, the, the, the center director, some of the teaching artists and some of our kids actually, we might even take an entire orchestra into the school and we demonstrate the instruments. We hand out information, there's an application form, kids apply. Uh, the demand is way bigger than we can meet. Uh, think about this, in Moncton, we can take about 80 new kids in an, in an intake year. In those five schools, from only those grade levels, we, we had 420 applications for 80 spots. So we're in the priority neighborhood and, and we're only doing a small number of schools and a certain number of grade levels. And uh, so it's very challenging. We, we, we counsel with the principal and the teachers about who and get their advice who could most benefit. But that's one of our big challenges. It's, it's, we, we just can't accept everybody. Yeah. And uh, let's have one last uh, question. And I'm sorry to all of you who are writing those great questions that we, we can't take them all, but uh, they're all great. So let's say, uh, let's have one by uh, Grace Grasse. Uh, she says she asks, once the children are part of the program, do you bring up social discussion issues with them, or is the program mostly focused on music and the positive results come mostly from the team and kids' music work? That is a really, really good question. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of differing views on this. Uh, we don't have a social curriculum. Okay, so we are... Uh, social change through music and the orchestra. So now we, we believe that in the living of life every day in the, with each other and in the context of ensemble playing that all kinds of lessons are learned. So, so we, we, we more deal with the wider dynamics in the context of doing music. Uh, and so, you know, uh, so someone makes a comment in a classroom that's, that's, that, that's racially inappropriate. Well, that would be dealt with in that moment and that child and that class, right? So it's, it's more in, 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 you know, in, in living out life, those, you know, those wider societal things are, 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 are dealt with. And, uh, but, but uh, you know, we are, one of our teaching artists said the music doesn't lie, you know, so we're, we're highly focused on, on, on excellence, on, on, and, and we believe that the orchestra is enough. It's, it's a fantastic and wonderful and beautiful tool for kids to learn the values and to gain the attributes they need to be successful in their life. So that's our perspective. Uh, we're heavily focused on the music, on the performance, uh, on living life in community, right? And, uh, and we learn those lessons as we go. Well, as uh, everything that you've mentioned or talked about today, it's, uh, it's clear and it uh, shows the passion and the, the intelligence that went into all your uh, building this, uh, this wonderful project. Uh, we we'll keep you for the whole day, Ken. It's, it's been great to have you. Uh, it's, uh, it's, I think what you're doing is uh, it's life changing and it's, uh, it's moving for all of us to, to hear you uh, in your words describe it. Uh, also to see how you've made it, uh, the system of very, very uh, enclosed and aware of the community you are in. And I think the, 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 you deserve all the success of this organization. But uh, a huge thank you for your, uh, your time with us today, uh, Ken. It was, a, it was an honor and a joy to have you. Well, it's my pleasure. And uh, I wish you all well. Great summers. Uh, great time together uh, as, as a group within OF. And uh, thanks for inviting me.
Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks again, Ken. Uh, merci à tout le monde à la maison, uh, tous ceux qui, uh, qui nous ont écoutés sur YouTube. Thanks to all of you who's, uh, who have tuned in on YouTube Live. Uh, this will be reposted later on. You'll be able to watch it again. Merci à tous nos étudiants à l'OF uh, d'avoir pris le temps aussi de passer ces moments avec nous. Merci pour vos excellentes questions. Et puis, euh, on vous laisse euh, aujourd'hui, on a une autre session bientôt. Euh, juste avant de terminer, euh, encore une fois, l'orchestre remercie tous ses partenaires, tant des gouvernements, euh, le gouvernement du Canada, euh, la Fondation euh, Banque royale, Canimex, la Fondation Jeunesse musicale du Canada, la Fondation Sibila SE, Emploi Québec et puis la Fondation de la famille Zeller. Alors, thank you to all and We will see you on the next uh, chapter of this uh, series of uh, In Conversation With. Thank you all and see you soon.